everyone. Good morning. Nice to see you here. And welcome back to Code Refinery Day 5, I believe it is already. Yes, Day 5. Uh, to, today we will have uh, documentation and uh, Jupyter notebooks. And uh, we will start here with the documentation lesson for the next two hours. My name is Samantha Witke. I work as a geoinformatics specialist at CSC in Finland. And with me here is Radovan. Hi, everybody. And I work, so Radovan Bast, I work in Tromsø, Northern Norway, doing code refinery, doing resource software engineering support and teaching and high performance computing. And really looking forward to today. It's both sessions will be around documentation and documentation is so important for re reusability as we will discuss. Yes. Um, so for the schedule of today, we will have uh, two exercises again, one in roughly 20 minutes and one in about an hour where we will give you some time to work in your groups or by yourself as you prefer. And then also one break at the full hour. And, and speaking of uh, exercises, yeah. we we heard your feedback from yesterday. So yesterday they were not enough, which doesn't give groups enough space to work together and discuss. Today there will be many exercises. So in the first session, two. In the second session, there will be hopefully two. So today we will have four exercise sessions. Really interactive workshop today. Yes. And uh, now this first lesson uh, will be very programming language independent. So we are not talking about any specific program language here. We will be talking about uh, readmes, why they are useful, when they are maybe even enough, uh, what uh, is maybe the content of a good readme. And then we will also talk about uh, documentation generators and how you can like use markdown or uh, restructured text to make some beautiful uh, documentation pages, and then also how to publish these to GitHub pages. And uh, here in the collaborative document, we have uh, the first link to actually yesterday's lesson, because we thought it fits quite well um, as an introduction here to look a little bit back on this. Uh, so we had here these six, six helpful steps uh, mm -hmm. to reproducible research where already step two starts with using good names for files, folders and functions. And that's really where also documentation already starts because everywhere where you already have a good name for things, where people can imagine something um, when reading this name, that's already documentation that you don't have to write extra like this. Uh, variable means so and so, but if you have a good name, they can imagine mm -hmm. right away. And then it goes further to step three, document with care. And there we have readme, metadata, code comments, and we'll go into all of these a little bit today. And these are really important things. It's uh, out of these six aspects, two will be discussed this morning. It's really important. And hopefully we manage to motivate everybody to not that this is not an afterthought, that this is part of it. This is part of programming. And we will hopefully motivate uh, why and how to do it and how we do it. And that was also a very important point um, that it's part of the code and it should evolve with the code. Like we have in the collaborative document already under the questions that documentation does not match reality. So like if you have some documentation that you wrote for the first version and then the code evolves, but the documentation doesn't, that can make things very uh, confusing. So it's always good to keep it close to the code and have it there whenever you do some updates in the code, also check that the documentation is up to date at the yeah. same time. And what it means in practice is that here the point two and three, they go really hand in hand with point four. So whatever documentation we choose, and it can be a readme file, it can be more, it should be under version control in the same place where the code is. If it's not, then there is a risk that code evolves in one way and documentation evolves in the other way. And at some point they are out of sync. So we really, we will show you also how, how to do this. How can we keep here two and three 
in sync with the with where we version control the code. Yeah, and then um, also one thing to keep in mind that it can also be so that it's human and machine readable. So we have one example that we are actually using now during the course already in our collaborative notes. You may have noticed that you can write in uh, Markdown in this case. And then when you click on the view, view format, it looks very nicely rendered. So you can actually read it in both ways. But for the human, of course, it's a little bit nicer to maybe read the rendered version. But even the plain text version is quite quite nice and easy to understand also as a human and as well as a computer there. Yeah. And a little reminder for those who maybe joined today, which is fine. Um, so in this collaborative document, if you click on the edit button, which might be on the top right or top left, then you see this document in, in Markdown and you can then really write and edit. And as a nice side effect, you then learn Markdown as you go. And we will use Markdown also later later today. Yo. So let's jump into the lesson material. All right. I will be screen sharing. Here we are. Let me know if I should go into one of the episodes already. And we, I will yes. also place. So everybody, you can find where we are We in here. We will keep this uh, so in the document. Yes, let's jump right away into the motivation. We have already in motivation. We go and I zoom in again. And there we now want to know from you, um, like because finding time for writing documentation is maybe sometimes hard as a researcher. You have to focus on getting your results out. So why would you want to bother? And what what can you focus on? Um, and then we also want to collect some tips. So we will um, copy these questions into the collaborative document. Is documentation important and why? How could you describe useful documentation? And how can you motivate your colleagues to contribute to the, co co um, to the documentation? That's maybe sometimes really hard to do. So really, if you have any tips on how you could motivate your colleagues to do that, um, let us know here. And maybe I ask this from Radovan directly. So why is documentation important? Why do you feel like it's important? Yes, uh, I'm just still editing here, but on the document. But I now copy copy this question in here. Why is it important? Because without documentation, it's really hard for anybody else to get started. They will have to sp spend a lot of time. They will have to re reverse engineer from reading the code, how to use it. And many users of a code don't even have the possibility to open up the code and read it and uh, understand it. So it's really important for other people. It's also important for the future, for me who will then forget how, how that worked, for reusability. How about you? What, um, what do you find, the, why is it important for you? Um, I think the most convincing point for me to really start thinking more about documentation and start writing it also right from the beginning when I start a new project is for myself because I am personally jumping from project to project quite a bit. So even tomorrow I might not remember like what was it actually about that I was writing and how to use it anymore. <laughs> so um, writing this down in a, like a nice way even just for myself helped a lot um in many occasions and then of course when you're then at the point that you want to publish or share your code then um it gets much easier for others as well i also added uh, one more question which is then a little bit oops which is from below on the page we can try to at the same time we will come back to it but we can try to create a wish list of what should documentation contain like a checklist, which, which let's let's co co draft a wish list checklist. Yes. Yeah, and maybe we can let that run for a little bit and check back later. And now um, continue and jump into the README. All right. Yeah, we can do that. 
maybe I, I so we will are we going to return to it i find this also really an important question but we will come back to these questions yeah let's come back maybe okay. after the exercise good yes we are perfect in time so we will return to this page and i will now jump into where do i go now into so we don't do this we don't do this we go into readme yeah should we tell people what they what they can find there or are we doing that later no we can you can tell now so there are two episodes here which we will not go through in detail but there you can find overview of popular tools and pros and cons um what are advantages disadvantages of certain tools that are really popular when documenting code we will not go through this episode we will rather in this lesson we will really focus on readme files and we will focus on we will show you one html static side generator and then there is also an episode about uh, when you want to write documentation inside the code which is good for those who for the developers but maybe not that's not enough for the users of the code but here we we then give some tips of how to write useful comments and what is what makes a comment more useful less useful if you if you also want to know what is a doc string and how does a doc string look in your favorite language and how how they differ from a comment then you can look at this later so here we have an episode on that but in this workshop and in this lesson we want to then focus on readme files and we want to focus on sphinx as an example for a static site generator so let's go into readme files and the readme file <clears throat> is and often it is called readme.md or readme.rsd why is that oh because the two really popular um, ways of writing a readme is either markdown or something called restructured text here we will more focus on markdown we think it is easier and markdown is also the thing that we see here in the collaborative notes so when i click on edit this is markdown markdown has headings and you can do lists and you can do paragraphs and you can do a couple of more things and maybe it was it is useful if i jump into the popular tools and only scroll into the markdown here this is how markdown looks headings subheadings paragraphs we can make text bold and emphasized we can do lists we can do a lot more images tables links and this is what we do in the in the collaborative notes and if you are curious about this other language which is very popular restructured text this is how the same thing would look in restructured text and back to readme's um, we now have a couple of exercises for you so there is readme1 readme2 readme3 and you can choose the one that is most interesting to you you can also try all of them and let me now tell you what they are about but then you can read more so the exercise readme1 will be to have some fun with some features that you can do in a readme on github that you may not have heard about which can make your readme more interesting easier to read easier to browse um, there is you can do notes highlights warnings you can also use something to if you want to hide details and there will be a little icon where you can unroll it and hide it again you have maybe seen readme files that, that have badges for dois for testing for documentation so you can experiment with that and try to add a badge to your readme so that's exercise one exercise two readme two would be to take one of your projects it can be something that you work on right now or have recently worked on 
and look at your readme. Do you have a readme? If not, then try to create one. Um, try to create a readme following a checklist, which we have discussed earlier. No, we haven't yet, but we are now uh, developing the checklist together in the collaborative document. So here you can try to improve your own readme. Exercise three would be to take a project that you use and have a look how do they do their readme and discuss what is what do you like about it? Is there anything you would like to take into your own project? What is maybe missing? So these are the things that we can try now. We would we still have a little bit of time. But we could be, use the time after the exercise to go through the wish list. Or do you want to do that now? I wonder what is more useful for the exercise. I wonder I think it would be useful to look at look at it before that. Okay, let's go to the collaborative document then. So what are the things that we think should be whoops, I should click into view mode. Here we have to get a created a wish list. So then when you look at your own readme or when you look at the readme of a project that you have used use the checklist is there a copy pasteable example is it version controlled or is there is there even a general explanation of what the code is doing because that is clear to the person who wrote the code but not, maybe not so clear to everybody else how to and, contribute yeah and very important also this general explanation, because this readme is usually the first thing that a person that visits your repository sees, like it's right there. So that's really what you want them to know should be there. Yeah. Right up top. And then during the exercise, hopefully we can collect some really nice um, examples of readmes. Good. So we will send you into a 20 minute session select readme one two or three or all of them and then when we come back uh, 20 minutes later um, at 40 past the hour then <clears throat> then we can return to these questions on the collaborative document and we can see what is missing and maybe we will get some nice examples if you see nice examples post them on the on the collaborative document and we can browse them together is that clear what to do everything good we should add it to the document and we have it in the document so exercise until 40 past and the goal is read me one one and or two and or three and yeah see you again 40 past have fun with readmes they are often really enough for documentation and then we will talk more. See you then. And hello, everybody. Welcome back from exercise session. First of all, thanks a lot for writing questions. We were a little bit worried because we didn't get any questions. So please add your questions and comments because that gives us a really good feeling that we are connected to you, you some people are listening. The more questions, the better. Um, I wanted to here show. So one question is, if you see some nice reading examples, you can post links here. Let's have a look at those. And maybe you have done experiment with some of the features. So this project is GeoPandas. It's a Python tool for geographic data. And here, this is a nice readme. It has a, on top we see these badges that then take me to Zenodo. Here is the published DOI. I can, I, I see an overview over the like testing status, launch binder, what is that? We will see that later today. Um, there is a nice overview, introduction, and then also how to install it. Copy pasteable example, so if you, if I copy paste this into my Python interpreter, it will it will just work like that. And this is this is great. It gets gets me started. 
I really like this example. Here's another example, Scalene. It's a tool to for profiling code. High level purpose of what, what, what is this even trying to solve? It has an, this is how to install it, either like this or Conda. It also has these little expandable sections if so you can you can keep the readme nicely organized it doesn't have to be too a too huge wall of text good i wanted to return to the questions that we asked at the beginning one was the wish list and thanks a lot for assembling this here i wanted to highlight three things that i find most important for other people well, it's copy pasteable examples, it's purpose, and it's how to cite. Interestingly, these are the three things that are often missing. Because the purpose is very clear to the person writing the code, spending 50 hours every week on it. So in, for your readme, consider adding these. Um, and then I also wanted to return to the other question that we asked. Which is, um, yeah, I think a good question, but not easy to answer. Um, how can we motivate ourselves and our colleagues to contribute to documentation and to see part to see the documentation as part of coding? Do you have a recommendation, Samantha? Well, seeing it also as a way to mm, shielding your own like time from these general questions like what is it about and these kind of things and writing it down right away so that you never have to send this email twice explaining what it's all about or have this meeting twice where you have to explain it maybe mm -hmm. it's a good way i don't know if that motivates colleagues but at least oneself maybe what do one, you think oh uh, yeah one really nice approach that i have seen and that i want to adopt is so-called tutorial driven programming that we don't even start from programming because often we start programming and then later we will do the documentation later in parentheses never um, i've seen a nice approach where it goes the opposite way where you start with tutorials let's start with a tutorial and let's write a tutorial even before the code exists this has the nice advantage that we start with the documentation, but we also think about the usability of it. And we we imagine how do we want to use it. And let's let's document how we will use it. Even and it doesn't exist yet. And then we write the code to match the tutorial. And then we have both. So that can be a nice approach. So here super happy to see questions flowing in. Please continue. I will give now the word to Samantha. Let's go to the next section. Let's go a little bit deeper into this documentation topic. So now we have seen readmes. Um, you can read the section about in-code documentation. But now you maybe also have seen that some uh, projects, or maybe you have used it already, that they have uh, separate documentation from the code. So not only the readme, but really a separate website even um, where they show more details into what's the software about and all these topics that we can also have in short in the readme. And we want to introduce you here to one tool that you can use to write this kind of uh, documentation and that is called Sphinx. And we want to introduce you to it uh, using Markdown. And Sphinx is one example of uh, so-called static site generators. So you write Markdown and then uh, you run Sphinx on that markdown file and a little bit more in the background. Um, and then it builds you a really nice looking, nice, nice and clean looking website. And the reason or one reason why we also choose Sphinx for this is that this lesson material that you are actually seeing here in now, I think all of the lessons uh, is built with Sphinx. And here at this point, maybe we can take a look at this lesson, which you see in front of you here. And then there is the link to the source code. All right. Um, so we can compare a bit how it looks. 
let me do that and I will try something f funny here. Can I look both oh, at the same yes. time? That looks good. And you can compare Sphinx and Markdown, Sphinx and Markdown. Objectives, understand how static site. So here on, in one screen, we see both the source code, which is Markdown and sometimes some extra stuff. And it is rendered to a nice looking website. And this is how we built all our lessons. So it's not just some tool that we would talk about, it's the tool that we really use every day. Yeah, and also um, you can already, when looking at the the markdown file, you can already imagine like how it will look in the end. So while writing, you don't always have to like render it to see how it actually looks. But um, the way markdown is written, I think it makes it also easy to imagine like to already design your page while you're writing just this plain text file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that, that I can, so often in my editor, I write this thing directly and then, then, then I can check how does it look on the website. We will practice that. So we'll practice exactly this step of uh, creating a website from our markdown document. Yes, and you can have nice these code boxes also that Radovan is showing right now on screen. Yeah, and this is an important one. We will need it soon. Oh yeah. Everybody. Well, should I close this one now the source code? Ah uh, yes, yeah. I think we can close it now and actually um prepare you for the upcoming exercise. Or do you have anything to add now before we start this? Just looking here at questions whether anything is burning. Oh uh, I think this is all good. So the big picture yeah. is we will now discover the tool called Sphinx. We will build a website from Markdown. Locally? And only locally. Locally means we will do it on our computer. That will be step number one, but then we will take it a step further. We will also show you how you can do these things on GitHub and then host them on GitHub or your other favorite web service. Like this and lesson, for example, you mm -hmm. can see from the link coderefinery.github.io, it's also hosted there. Oh yeah, yeah, we host this thing there. This is how we host this lesson, all the lessons. Uh, then the nice thing about such an approach will be that all we need to think about is if we want to make a change, we send a pull request and here edit on GitHub. And every time somebody modifies the repository, it updates the, the website, it updates the documentation. And here we are back to this very important concept of having the documentation go together with the code in the same Git repository. And we want to show you this tool. And this tool is good if you want to if you want more than a readme. If your project grows out of a readme and you want to have a little bit more website where with pages where people can navigate, then Sphinx is a really nice tool. And at the end of the lesson, we will show you that there are other tools that really work like Sphinx. So once you understand how Sphinx works, you you can then go and select any of the, any of the other tools. Okay. Good. So let's jump into it. So Radovan will show um, what we now need to do in preparation for the exercises. And here it will be very good if you can follow along. If you have uh, followed the installation instructions and have all the tools installed. If you don't have that right now, um, then it's maybe better to lean back and watch and try it later at home because it might take a moment to, to set these things up. But if you have followed the installation instructions, then you can follow now together with Radovan, copy the different uh, cells and we prepare you for the ex upcoming exercises. Yeah, so I will try that here. So the Conda Activate Code Refinery I already have done. I'm in the Code Refinery environment. I will now also try these other three things because now I'm checking Python version. Um, in my case, it's a little bit different. It's not a problem. And this is, this is a tool built using Python, but it's not only for Python projects. We, uh, we use Sphinx for all kinds of projects. I want to verify these other two things. Sphinx build. This is a tool that we I will need. Okay, it That's seems for to work. actually building the um, documentation from the Markdown file. And we will also use Quick Start to 
bootstrap a new project. This seems to work. And finally, I will also run this one. And here I want to see ideally no error messages. So on my side, it looks good. If you get any errors here, it probably means that you are either not in the not in the right environment, maybe you didn't install the envir environment, you can then, as Samata said, try that either during the exercise or a little bit later. But please don't give up if this doesn't work. It There is still a lot of nice things coming up in the lesson. It would be pity if you then disconnect only because uh, something fails here in in the software environment. And then looking at the time, we have five minutes before the break. And in these five minutes, should we then try to quick start a project, create a project out of nothing? Should we try that? Yes, let's do that. And for this, I will follow uh, and, one. and I will type just to be a little bit slower so that do not go too fast. I will create a folder. Put the link. And I go in there. So I create a new directory, which is empty. And in that directory, I will run this quick start. And Swing quick start is, is this tool that helps me. It will ask me a few questions and it will help me set up a new Sphinx project. Yeah, and you and, could also do yeah. all this manually. You don't have to use Sphinx Quick Start, but it makes it very easy to get yeah. started and get something there. And now I will see these questions. Sphinx Quick Start. Separate source and build directory. So I don't know what that means, but let's say no. So the default is no. And if I hit enter here, it will be no. And later, if you change your mind, you can reconfigure it. But I say no, enter. Project name, what should I choose? Poof, naming is hard, my project. <laughs> Author, oh, we are the, I don't know, workshop, the instructors. Ah, I will use my name. Doesn't matter so much for the uh, exercise. So author, project release, uh, you can say 1.0, I will, it's not finished yet, 0 0.1. So these answers, you don't matter much. It, we can reconfigure. And in which language do we want this to be? I will start with English, so I will hit enter. And then finished initial directory structure has been created. Wonderful. So now we and could go and take a look what has actually been created. Like since we've just freshly created this directory, everything that's in there now has been actually created by Sphinx Quick Start. Yeah. So what should I do now, LS maybe? So we got a couple of new files. The, the two files that we will focus on here are index, which is the starting point, the entry point for my documentation, from where on you can branch, branch out into different files. The second interesting file is configuration file. It asks me some of these questions. If I change my mind and I want to change the author or the project number, Oh, so, sorry, the version number, I would go into a configuration file and change it. And if you are curious about what the other files mean, we have a little table here. And now we are actually advised to open up the index file. And yeah, let's take a look. Look in there and edit this a little bit. And I will open it up in Nano. <clears throat> So you can also, again, use your favorite editor to take a look at the index.rst file. Yeah, so instead of nano, it could be VS Code, it could be Vim. Uh, here for simplicity, I will use nano. And, and this in... is also the only uh, RST file that we have to work with when we work with Sphinx. 
everything else we can write in Markdown. Mm -hmm. And this is just the, well, the index file where everything comes together. But everything that you need that is really uh, RST related is already there. And we will only add few lines there as yeah. instructed in the... Up here uh, it's in nice colors. Here it's black and white because my editor is not, doesn't color it. But what is here on top is a comment. It could be anything. Here we will have a heading. Here is something interesting, which is the table of contents. And then we have indices and tables. And to keep it simple, for the purpose of this exercise, we don't really need these indices and tables. I will remove them. It's not a problem if you leave it there, but I will remove it to keep it a little bit simpler. And then if I want to add additional files, this is how I can refer reference them. So what, what you will do, what we can do now and then later in the exercise is here I can add additional files, which will be then part of the table of contents. And maybe you have a better name than some feature. I didn't come up with a better name. So here we will document some feature and later we will document another feature. And you can list markdown files here and then they will get, they will be part of the documentation. But let's start with some feature. Note the indentation here, that's important. And the indentation are these, these three spaces. Right. So the sum feature has to line up nicely with what is here on top. If I would do this, it would not work. It has to nicely line up. Okay, let's take a look also at the um, conf file mm -hmm. so that okay. we can actually write our sum feature.md in markdown because Sphinx originally does everything in RST. So for that, you would not have to add any extensions. But since we want to write our files in Markdown, because we just find that's um, most straightforward and you have practiced it already, we need to add another, um, well, an extension to, to Sphinx so that it can work with these Markdown files. Yeah. And we have practiced this when asking questions in the notes document, which is in Markdown. So let me save this. Save, yes, yes. And now what was I supposed to open up? Conf. Yep. And here on top, you see, here are the answers to the questions. So if I don't like them anymore, I can change them. And now we were supposed to make a little modification here. So instead of using no extensions, we want to use this one. And save, oh, I'm in the wrong window. Save, yes, exit. And now our, my table of contents refers to a file called some feature, which doesn't exist yet. Let's all create it. Some feature. And here to get started, I will try to copy paste this into it. We have a heading, we have a subheading, we have some text, we have a bullet point list, which can be nested. And then later in the exercise, you will then improve this. This is, uh, this is our starting point. And I can see we are really already past the hour. And got a comment to please slow down. So you can mm -hmm. do this as part of the exercise. So the exercise will have 20 minutes um, time and you can start with this Sphinx one there. Yeah, but first we will do a break. Yes. And when we get from the break, we will spend one minute to send you in, into the exercise. In the exercise, you can then, this was quick, but in the exercise, you will be able to quick start, modify index, modify the configuration, and then experiment with some features. Should we meet back here at 12 minutes past the hour to be yep. to really have 10 minutes. Excellent. We'll be back. See you then. See you after the break. Bye. Bye. And welcome back from break. Welcome back. Um, one a little bit less than one hour left in the documentation. One of my favorite lessons, one of my favorite topics. And we will now also practice uh, one of my favorite tools, which is Sphinx.
and uh, we will give you almost half an hour. And that is to really give you enough time to set up your environment. And a good goal is to to do what, what I did. Quick start, um, edit the table of contents, create an additional file, and try to get it, try to see the result in your browser, following our instructions. So here you can then follow a little bit more and there will be instructions on how you can be, see this website in your browser. That's, the, that's a really good goal for the next almost half an hour. Then if you want more, we have, uh, there is, you can discover additional features. If you want to experiment with math equations and see how do they render in, in this tool, you can try that. And if you have time left, you can already move on to the next episode and try to build Sphinx directly on GitHub pages. No problem if you get stuck here on the way, because we will then show this part together in the last 20 minutes of this lesson. Please keep the questions coming. We would like to see more questions and more comments on the collaborative notes. And then we see you again 40 minutes past the hour. Good luck with the exercise. Bye, see you then. And welcome back from the exercise session and we are on the collaborative document. And it would be so nice for us to hear how it went. So please let us know, um, did it work? Which part worked? Did you get stuck? Maybe you didn't try. Hopefully we have created a safe space where we really welcome and appreciate honest feedback. So also if you didn't try, if it was really confusing, please let us know. It helps us to decide what we do next. And maybe a question to the people here in the studio. What, so during an exercise session, what do we do? Um, what is happening here while there is an exercise happening? Are we having a break or uh, what do we do? Maybe we should have, but usually we talk a lot about <laughs> what has been going on and what we will say next and who will start. Yeah. So we really reflect on what went well, what didn't go well. We planned our next steps. It's really fun. I think sometimes we should also stream that, but we don't want to interrupt the exercises. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we discussed answers to some of the questions that you posted. So that was also yeah. fun. So it's busy, but it's really fun. Um, let's see what we, what should we do next? Should we, should I show you what I did here? Also in the meantime, I tried to create Sphinx one and two and three. Oops. And this is the website that I generated and it lives on my computer. This is not on the internet. This is really just on my hard drive. And we, I created these two files. One was called some feature. The other one was called other feature. In the other feature, I tested out some of the things that I can do with Markdown and Sphinx like tables and code blocks and equations and paragraphs. And now I'm wondering whether we should try to move on to the next episode and test this out on GitHub. Yes, let's try to move it. Oh, I, I forgot one thing. And that was, I wanted to comment on one question that helps understanding. And this one before moving on. So now we show Sphinx, but somebody asked, how does it compare to some other tool called MKDocs? And indeed, there are many tools. And I, I put the link on the collaborative notes, which takes you here. There are a number of tools. Sphinx is one of them. This is the one that we show. But there are a number of tools with the same idea. They take Markdown and produce websites. And after the workshop, you can then select the one that you like best. But uh, once we understand how one of them works, we, we know how all of them work, more or less. Back to the script, we, we will now move on to 
we have built Sphinx locally. I will now show you how we can do that on GitHub directly. And if you got stuck and it didn't completely fail, it didn't work on, on the computer, now it's also a chance to start afresh. You can, you can try it with me or later you can also watch how I do it, how we do it with some other here. Because we will try to put everything together here. We will try to build a Sphinx project, but using something called uh, GitHub Actions. We will show you what that means. And here, step number one, if you want to try that out now or later, is that I will take this GitHub project template. And from this template, I will create a GitHub repository in my namespace. So maybe now watch what, what I do. And also, Samantha, please watch what I do. And please correct me if I do something unexpected. I will give it a name, documentation. I will call it doc example. And it should be public. This is just for demo. Demo, please watch. Create repository. It, it will look very familiar. Okay, generating, generating. What are the familiar things? There is a readme. It could be better, but it's a starting point. There is a license, very nice. We remember from yesterday that licenses are good to have. There is a folder called doc and a folder called SRC, source code. We can imagine that our project is then in all the code is in this source code directory and all the documentation is in the doc directory. And if I navigate in there, it will look familiar. Here is our index RST. And here is the one markdown file. Here is another markdown file. And here is the configuration file. And now I'm not sure what I should do next. I should. Now all I need to do is I need to add a file, which is a, a GitHub action workflow. Oh, what is going on here? Should I maybe first add it and then we explain how it works or should I explain how it works and then we add it? I feel like, but there was also a question in the notes. Okay, Got which one is it? More comments on the, what, what's actually happening here. Which question are we on? Um, 20, is it? No, is it this 19. one? Mm -hmm. Just copy paste, but I don't really know how much about the commands. Let's talk about the commands. So let's copy paste and let's discuss. I should create a file called with this name. And I can do that directly on GitHub. Add file, create new file. And here on top, let's see whether this works. Yes, so I want a file with a certain structure, dot GitHub slash workflows. And here I can give it a name, documentation, with a certain extension. And in here, I will copy paste this workflow. And now let's also discuss a little bit what the workflow does. The workflow has a certain name. It will run on certain events. Every time somebody pushes a change or we merge a pull request, it will run whatever comes here. It runs in a container. So maybe we remember containers from yesterday. It creates a Linux container for me. And in this container, it, it installs a couple of dependencies. And here we recognize it installs things. It in installs this parser and something else and a theme. And then the other command that we will maybe recognize from earlier from the exercise session is that we built the website from Markdown. 
and there is a little bit more but we can for the moment ignore the more i will commit it let's give it a better commit message adding workflow to build sphinx commit and now what will happen next hmm. and now if i should check on actions and now something is running so this this action is this script is running because i made a change to the to the repository and very soon it will switch to green and say that it's done and once it's done okay i need to do a little bit more i need to go to settings and pages so this is done but i need in my repository a few more steps we are almost there settings pages and i want to enable from github pages this is a branch which was created by this workflow and from this branch i want to serve my website to the world github pages save and i think that's it and if that worked i should be able to see my website but i need to do a bit of the repository was called doc example and my user is not called user it's my username on github so my username on github.github.io slash the repository name and now fingers crossed and enter pushed and i have a website which is not on my computer it's on it's on github it looks but a it little looks bit different. different why does it look different yeah why does it look different good question let's see i go back to the repository back into documentation back into configuration it's the conf py and i need to make this more readable uh this is this is the reason so now we have we have changed the theme and you can we wanted to show you that you can change the look of your sphinx project and here we we chose the sphinx read to docs theme which is the same theme that we use for our lessons so that's why this looks very similar to the code refiner lessons that we have been using and what is read to docs read to docs is a service that you can also use to host sphinx projects for open source projects for free as an alternative to github okay catching up with questions here so we have eight minutes left so to summarize what we what happened here we have no so now I understand that this was probably way too quick to follow along but please do try it later try try this step-by-step -step recipe to to have us things projects directly on github pages we have used something called github actions which is which is a way of uh, running a script every time i change the repository and in this case we use the script to build a sphinx project tomorrow we will come back to github actions and we will use it to test our code and so with the same solution here we can do automated tests or automated building of documentation and automated spell checking there are lots of things we can do with tools like uh, github actions this is not the only way to do that uh, similar solutions exist on on other platforms and with other names but i think it's really fun and to try this out which leads me to taking a step back and looking at this a little bit from a like a big picture is that this can also be a nice solution to host your own homepage or your project website 
on services like GitHub Pages. And we have an episode on it. And also there, we have a step-by-step -step, um, example on how you can try it out. But the essence here is that any project on GitHub, any repository which has a branch called GitHub Pages, and this can be configured, this can be changed, but by default, any repository with such a branch can be used to generate a website. And this is how I this is how I um, built my homepage. This is how we built CodeRefinery.org. So CodeRefinery.org is, is really a GitHub repository. And you can even change how this looks to the outside world. It doesn't have to be CodeRefinery.github.io slash repository. We, we can serve it under our own domain name. This is a really nice way of having a project website homepage without running your own web server. I'm just answering here a question on the document and also Samantha let me know if I, what we should focus on. You can go um, forward, I think, and show the last page of this lesson yeah. also. Yes, let's summarize what we learned. What did we learn here, summary episode? It's, it's a balance, it's always a balance choice. So hopefully we were not too dogmatic. There is not the one right way. Readme is not the right answer for, to all the projects. Sphinx is not the right answer to all the projects. It's always about choosing a balance. We believe that Readme is a good starting point. It is good enough for most of what we do. And once a project grows out of a Readme, then we can go to tools like Sphinx. Later today, so we will soon take a one hour break. But after the break, we will be back with, and we will talk about Jupyter Notebooks, which can be a really nice alternative. It's a nice way of, again, bringing documentation and code together into one place. So that's another nice way of not only sharing code, but also documenting what it does and how to use it. And for simple scripts, for data visualization as a supporting information to publications, Jupyter Notebooks maybe are the right answer. Readme, Source Sphinx, yeah, it's they are pros and cons and it's it's often a process. And this is important. Uh, how to make sure that code changes go together with documentation changes? Well, one thing that we need to make sure is that we are in the same Git repository. Otherwise it's hard. The other way to help with this is to make make documentation part of your code review. So if somebody sends a pull request and when we team up with our colleagues and we review each other's code, let's not only look at the code, let's also look at the documentation. And then we can remind each other that this is really nice, but where is the documentation? Did we update it as well? And I have talked about tutorial driven development earlier, which is not my idea, but I really like that idea. There is a fantastic slide deck of somebody who presented this one year ago at a conference. So have a look at this. This is a nice approach of turning things around and starting with the usability and the tutorial and then writing code to match the documentation. Mm -hmm. There was one the question, question in the document about how you changed the theme. Do you want to show that? How you how you changed it from the Sphinx theme to Yeah, that's a good question. I needed to do two things. One thing was in in your conf.py. You can try that locally on your computer or then on GitHub. There is look for HTML theme. And I think by default it's called Alabaster, and you can change it to lots of other themes. So many themes exist. This is one of them. But I needed to do one more thing, because if you do this, you need to make sure that you have this theme available. If you are in the code refinery code conda environment, you have it. But on GitHub, we 
we are not in the code refinery environment. So on GitHub, what I did is in my workflow, inside my workflow, I did, I installed it here. And this is one way of installing. I could have installed it through Conda. I could have installed it through requirements.txt. So I needed to do these two steps. And there is a really nice website called sphinxthemes.org where you can find like a screenshot of different themes and how they are called. I also added that to the collaborative document. Oh, we have, okay, let's see, theme, things, themes, here we go. The, yeah, the first one. Loading. Yeah, so Alabarsta is the default. Read the docs is maybe the most popular one, but then there are many, many more. And you can pick one of these, you can also customize them. Time is almost up. Uh, I wonder, are we asking for feedback now or at the end of the day, maybe end of the day? So please, stick, uh, please come back in one hour. There will be a session about Jupyter. Also, if you, if you use Jupyter Notebooks already, I believe we will have some new things to show you. So please come anyway, bring your colleagues, bring a friend. Anything more to say before we close for our lunch break? No, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for listening. Please keep the questions coming. We are looking at this and we will answer some of them also later today. So it's not a problem to ask even later. I hope this was useful. Let's create some amazing readmes and let's make it easier for our future selves. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the lunch break and see you later. Bye.